today we have some special guests and I think it's going to be a great time. Let's go ahead and get started with our 30th edition of the ML Ops Community Meetups. Today we have a very special treat for you. We have, oh man, let me see if I can pronounce this, Bert Han. Bert Let's see. Uh, 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 close, close enough. Close enough. Yeah. So you'll forgive me, though, I imagine. That's um, Bertan, senior data engineer. He's got 15 years of experience in the software industry. He's been doing cloud native stuff in DevOps teams. He's also been doing traditional desktop apps. He's built a variety of data products and machine learning platforms. So we have the one-two punch today. Bertan, on one hand, is our senior data engineer. And then we've got Axel on the other hand. He is our data scientist. And Axel has got his master's degree in data science and software engineering. He was working with customers, and he saw that the main complexity in data science are projects that are, so the main complexity lies in software built around predictive models. I am very happy to welcome the both of you today. I want to say thank you for joining us and thank you for putting up with my shenanigans at the beginning of this meetup. We very much enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, great to be here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so let's... um. Let's see, today we're gonna to talk a lot about serving models and scaling machine learning capabilities in large organizations. But before we get into that, any of that, usually I start off these meetups, um, uh, not, not like we have started them today. I start off the meetups by talking about how you all have gotten into tech. So maybe Axel, you can start Tell us what got you into tech. What got me into tech? Um, well, it all started in, uh, in high school where I, I always was really good at math and I really liked like mathematics. So I, I really wanted to do in my further studies something with the mathematics. But just doing pure mathematics seemed like a, a not very practical approach to, to apply this. And I, I, I was looking for some way of yeah, applying math in a, in a business context. So yeah, I, I stumbled upon um, a degree called knowledge engineering. And in this degree, we, we combined mathematics and computer science to, to solve uh, business problems. So we learned a lot about optimization, learned uh, a bit about machine learning and, and things like that. And this really, yeah, got me more into also the, the computer science part of, uh, of this study program. I did um, several internships. I did some work on the side next to my uh, degree where yeah, I did a lot of uh, software engineering, did a, built a lot of uh, machine learning models, built uh, applications around these models for, uh, for various customers. And yeah, that was the moment where I yeah, actually combined these mathematics skills, which are basically embedded in, in the machine learning uh, uh, knowledge and yeah, the uh, software engineering, which mm. was needed to actually make this model generate any value in a, in a real running system. Yeah, which is the important part. Yeah, so from, uh, yeah, from there I uh, yeah, continued my journey. I uh, uh, started working at uh, Big Data Republic, where I'm also uh, working now, where I'm actually working as a, as a consultant uh, officially as a data scientist, but uh, I do a lot of engineering projects uh, for customers as well. And here I'm, uh, I'm now focusing on, uh, uh, yeah, optimizing machine learning in uh, in companies. So making the, the whole process around it very efficient. Yeah, shout out to Big Data Republic, because I know you both are working there and I didn't mention that in my flustered state in the intro. So um, what about you? Bertrand, uh, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get the name right. <laughs> You'll be forgiven. I will, uh, I will give a call to my parents that I uh, did not set me up for an international career. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, yeah, actually, I remember uh, reading a basic book when I was a kid. I must be less than 10 years old. And I, I, I was reading this book and watching at this porn screen, this computer we had at the time, and, and I could not make sense of both of them, which was quite frustrating because it looked interesting to me. I, I forgot about it and went to the electrical engineering, actually. And then the last year by electrical engineering, I uh, had to do some fission basic programming. Then I could track it again. I was like, ah, yes, programming. That's, the, that's something really nice to do. So uh, I was like, yeah, I don't want to do electrical engineering, so let's go into uh, computer science then. So I just did follow-up studies, uh, studied computer science. And then in my last years of my bachelor, I got involved in uh, open source communities like KDE mostly. Uh, did some summer of code projects there, did some work on the KDE PIM uh, application suite and learned the uh, nice parts of software engineering there. Afterwards, I went into research. I'm, I'm still, I, I still not, not make up my mind if there was a cool thing or not. Uh, I guess I learned a thing or two, but uh, uh, did some research uh, mostly on uh, data visualization and data analytics, uh, not predictive analytics, but more like exploratory analysis. And that basically got me check it on the data part. And that's where I started combining uh, well, like data and, uh, and engineering. And uh, yeah, after five years of research, I uh, had enough and then went, went into the industry and solved real problems, there you as go. I thought. Dive in head first. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Did that for the last five years uh, at Big Data Republic as well. And uh, yeah, I had great fun working on a variety of projects where either working on end-to-end -end data products or uh, currently working on a machine learning platform at, uh, at a large bank in, uh, in the Netherlands. Mm, nice. So I know you both have two separate roles here and today we're going to talk about serving platforms and what we can keep in mind with them. Maybe we can start just by what is a model serving platform and when should we start investing in one? When should a company look at it? Yeah, actually, we'll kick off. Yeah, I can, maybe we can start with uh, yeah, a little bit of context about uh, how we work at the Big Data Republic and what kind of customers we serve because from that background, we kind of built up this knowledge and uh, that's what we put, uh, yeah, that's a context we will talk about in this, uh, in this uh, podcast. So we mostly work for uh, digital non-native uh, companies. So we're not working for uh, big IT companies. We're not, not working for the, the Netflixes and the Ubers of, uh, of this uh, world, but we're working for businesses that do not have an IT background, but who realize that uh, machine learning and uh, getting value out of data is actually very valuable to them and also needed because their uh, competitors are also working on getting value out of their data. So we typically have these companies to yeah, either get started with uh, machine learning or bring their machine learning to the next level if they have already explored this a little bit. So what the user, usual company does is they first uh, start doing a small proof of concept because they have never done something with machine learning before. They, they create a notebook where they do some small experiment on, on some use case. Then they realize that either that worked well or that uh, did not work well. If, if it didn't work well, they will, will try something else. But if, they, if it works well, the company usually wants to reuse this model and they uh, yeah, kind of have to wrap this model into some form of runtime, for example, by building an, an, an API with some library around it, such that other uh, programs in the company can, uh, can talk to it and people can actually use the, the predictions that the machine learning model is uh, doing. So from there on, they have their first model running in a, in a production system and they want to, to take new, new use cases on them. They want to expand. So they're creating more and more models and creating more and more of these, uh, these APIs that yeah, have to be maintained and have to uh, somehow serve uh, um, other parts of uh, the company. And it's actually a lot of repetitive work that these companies are doing because for every machine learning model, they again have to design the model, which is not really repetitive, but it's kind of uh, um, 
different every time, but for every of these models, they have to create a, a new runtime, have to create a new API, which basically always is the same step. And we think that this process, once you do it a lot of times, we can be made much more efficient through the help of a, a so-called model serving platform. And the model serving platform basically is uh, helps you with the very last step of your machine learning lifecycle and is taking your trained machine learning model and somehow puts that into a runnable application and make sure that that application will stay healthy and will stay serving predictions to uh, clients that uh, yeah want to have these predictions. Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah, I think a lot of people are at that stage right now, right? Where they're starting to see, hey, this can we automate this? How can we make this easier? Because there's a lot of repetitive tasks and we can potentially improve our efficiency. So what do you feel are some important features that need to be incorporated into a, a quality model serving platform? Yeah, let, let me get started on it. I think one of the important parts there is the uh, developer experience. And I you know I say developer, but I actually mean the developer experience of data scientist putting models into production. The thing we see a lot is that, um, well, in, in bigger companies you will actually have uh, you will have actually have engineering departments which which uh, help with bringing models to production. In smaller companies, uh, this distinction is often not so clear, and we see data scientists starting to produce or to develop applications around their models. Um, so one of the things uh, a machine learning platform should offer uh, is ways for data scientists to improve their uh, to way of working. So it should be easy to describe how do I want to run my model? I mean, do I want to run it uh, as a batch prop model? Do I want to run it as a request response model? Or do I want to run it as a, um, a streaming model? Um, and preferably do it in such a way that if, if a data scientist says, uh, I want to run it as a batch model, that he does not have to set up a Spark cluster, for example, but that, that the framework itself takes care of wrapping the model in such a way that it's suitable for batch processing or wrapping it in such a way it's suitable for uh, request response uh, serving. This way, it, this way it helps uh, data scientists to, to, to stick what they're good at, uh, uh, developing models which actually deliver value to the business process and not so much uh, solving engineering problems, which is, I think, a different, uh, different kind of uh, sport, I would say. The other thing I think which is really important is um, CI, CD. Basically, when we talk about uh, bringing machine learning models to production, we, we're just talking about uh, a software delivery uh, process. And we know how to do software delivery. I mean, there has been extensive research in this field and the literature is quite clear about that the kind of capabilities you need to do effective software delivery and CI, CD is one of them. So you make, a, you make a change to your model, you commit it to some kind of repository, then a build pipeline is triggered, which, which sends some test data through it, test that, um, make sure the model is still performing as expected, uh, and then actually deploys it to some kind of test environment so that it can be integrated with the remainder of the application. Yeah, can I, can I add to this as well, John? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think by having these, these two components, uh, first a good level of abstraction where the data scientist is not being scared by vast amount of code he has to write to ch change his simple Python model or a model in another language into some running application, plus the uh, CICD part where the, uh, the other steps that uh, are required for the data scientist to actually deploy it are automated. These, this combination of these two makes it yeah, very easy for the data scientist to, to deploy it and makes it also um, makes him independent of his engineering uh, buddies. So you don't get the problem that the data scientists pr produce great models, which could provide great value, but the engineers kind of get uh, overloaded by having to put, thing, having to put models into, uh, into production. So yeah, you, you free up time for the data scientist by, such that he can quickly iterate over his models and you free up time for your engineers such they can focus on making the platform better or focus on 
the non-machine learning parts of, uh, of your application ecosystem. Well put. Bertrand, do you want to talk about a little bit more about the serving part? Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's yeah uh, some more things to to cater for when you start uh, generalizing these things. So when you start serving models for specific application, you will develop these models over time, and you actually want to test if these models are uh, improving on the current model. So things like A/B testing. Uh, version management of your models, um, uh, triggering models in different ways because you have different applications using the same models. Um, uh, and, and also things like uh, accessing complex features. So typically when I think about the model, for me it's just like input to output. It's just like a simple transformation. And of course the, the transformation itself can be a complex thing. But it's often not that easy. Uh, for example, in the banking world, you have transactions and, and many of the features are things like the average transactions amount over, over the past week, for example. And if you look at these kind of features, which require some real-time processing, uh, you also see that, that uh, resulting often in a lot of complexity for the application using these kind of features. Uh, as well as um, in a lot of repeti repetitive work. I mean, let's say you have two models which are quite similar, both use the same feature, both are developed in different teams, and then those teams start to develop exactly the same feature uh, in maybe slightly different ways, but semantically with the, with the same meaning. If you could abstract these kind of complex features in a proper manner, where you um, uh, provide the capability, which is quite similar to the way we deploy models, uh, that 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 would be very beneficial for uh, for organizations scaling up and reusing features, especially complex features, or, uh, within your organization. One of the other things is uh, when you run models, uh, when you run software in general, you're of course monitoring it, and um, when you bring a model online, you're of course interested in the in the in the technicalities of the model, as in how many requests is it uh, serving per second, what are the response times, uh, how many uh, uh, failures do we have, and so on. But machine learning models are, of course, a bit different than normal software because we also have these uh, functional re functional requirements which we want to monitor. As in, um, let's say we have a feedback loop in place, we want to make sure that the model is performing within certain bounds. We also want to know if the features uh, which are serving as input for the model are following certain distributions. So we want to uh, detect things like data drift and um, um, yeah, concept drift. And for anyone, sorry to interrupt real fast, but for anyone who wants a deep dive on monitoring, we've got on the YouTube channel a few weeks ago, we talked with Lena and she walked us through a use case of when she was working at um, Zalando and how many different bugs she encountered just in the whole process and how you can start to see, wow, there's so many pieces to this puzzle and each little piece can have a bug and I will never get a sign if I'm just monitoring, hey, is everything on? Is it, it okay, my infrastructure is working, but my model could be going haywire, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. You, you're touching to a very interesting point here. The, the way I look at the machine learning models is they're basically part of a business process on which you, with some follow-up action should incur. And then at some point you will get some feedback. And if you look at the decision literature, it's basically shown that these are uh, complex processes which need to be treated differently than that simple or complicated processes. And especially the ability to iterate quickly and to monitor to see what's happening are two important capabilities you need in order to, to deal with the complexity of the whole situation. I mean, the, the model is just, uh, in my mind, it's just a very small piece of a, quite a complex puzzle. So everything which helps you to iterate quickly, try a new model, try a new model, try new features and so on, will help you to keep track of this bigger picture as well. Yeah, and by putting all these features that Bajan is now talking about, by putting them in a platform, by bringing this platform to your organization and having all your data scientists giving access to this, uh, this platform, you, yeah, you make sure it's all standardized, all the people used uh, the same features, 
also if you have to update some of these features or if you want to improve them for example you you have a, a model monitoring solution in place but you want to monitor some additional things that you haven't thought about before you are, you are, you have to only change it in one place and not have to ask all your teams to to do it or give all your teams the the information that they require to to monitor their system uh, even further so that's i think one of the really powerful powerful features of uh, adding such a platform to your organization. Yeah, I completely agree. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on, Bajan, before? I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm on mute. I just uh, realized. Uh, no, I think we, we, we covered most, uh, most important topics with respect to the features of such a platform. So my next question was around like all the different tools that are out there right now. I know there's a lot of people that are probably have played around with something like ML flow or Selden. Maybe they're using it in, in their day to day. And do you have any insights on when to use which tool, what kind of use cases would be, um, would be for like something like, Selden or, oh, well, maybe I need TensorFlow serving or Kubeflow serving, that kind of stuff. Uh, what have you found around that? Like, which, which pieces are nice? Should I uh, get this one, Bachan? Sure. I think here it's uh, going to give a really consultant answer. It depends. It's, uh, it really depends on what your, what's, what your company needs and what, what phase of maturity your your organization is in yeah. what are certain standards within the organization that you have to have to take care of and yeah, these really make yeah make it hard to give like a, a single uh, have you choice seen on. something like oh well if it's maybe less maturity you recommend this platform or if you're a much more mature company then you can recommend this one or is it not along those lines i think the um the more mature your company gets in how they do machine learning the less um uh, off the shelf platform will actually benefit you because most of these platforms so solve a small part of all these problems we talked about before and uh, once you get to a certain degree of maturity, you want more than these platforms can get, can bring you. These platforms are built such that the vast majority of people can use them, and not such that you, as a as an organization, can can specialize in them. So I think once you when you get started using these platforms, I, I think it's a good kick off to uh, to get started, and it, they can give you a lot of inspiration in how you could eventually maybe build your own system. Yeah, maybe I can add a bit to that. Uh, I, I think the most mature ones I've seen are, I guess, Selden, Hydrosphere, and um, Algorithmia is also quite a mature platform. Uh, but what they give you is a platform and technology. They don't give you a process. And um, you can have a platform with all the capabilities, but if you're not using them or if you don't have any process around them to, to use these capabilities or to know how to act on, let's say, certain alerts you have put in, um, they don't serve you that much, I would say. Another thing I see is that um, most of the mature ones, and I mean, <laughs> for good reason, uh, are partly open source. I think Selden Core is open source, for example. Hydrosphere has an open source uh, part. Mm. Uh, but then when you come to the advanced features, uh, you get into um, enterprise um, licenses. And this can be fine uh, if you really, as an organization, not into engineering. But if you have a high, uh, high demands on the functional aspects and on the engineering parts of these things, this, this might be... Um, this might be an issue. Yeah, That's it can be a point. big risk to take a proprietary software into your organization because you don't know at first how, how deep, uh, what the uh, software does. Well, you kind of have an idea, but you don't know under the hood how it works. 
you don't know how well it works and you don't know what the future of the the company that you take the product from uh, will look like so if the the, the company gets out of business or has some form of uh, shift in their company that might not suit your needs then yeah you have no way of actually changing that because it's a proprietary software so yeah and along those lines does that kind of it makes it seem like you normally are building custom solutions for clients or are you using some of these off the shelf tools i think it's really it really differs because yeah as we said there are so many different organizational re uh, requirements that yeah, for some companies, it makes sense to uh, to take an off-the-shelf product like uh, some Kubeflow or a cell and serving. But for some companies, they, they have totally different requirements and they, they're actually building their own. And that's what we can also help with, yes. Yeah, to a large extent, this is uh, a matter of timing. For example, the team I'm currently working in, I started working there two years ago. And when we, when we were... Starting the work there, we were reading the blogs of uh, Uber, which is a Michelangelo platform. And I think this was one of the more advanced platforms at the time, which was published about. And it um, described a lot of ideas which we want to implement at the time. And uh, I guess Sheldon and Hydrosphere existed at the time, but were definitely not as advanced as what Uber uh, Michelangelo was uh, offering at that point. And, uh, yeah, that led to a uh, decision a team to, to, to build something from scratch. Uh, but, so that was a timing issue, basically. I mean, if, we, if I were starting the same team this time, I would uh, make different choices, clearly. Um, but that, that's still not leaving out that even over time, you can uh, merge uh, custom solutions with, uh, with, with existing platforms as well. So, for example, we're currently evaluating uh, Selden and Algorithmia to see if you can uh, replace parts of our custom built pipeline with, uh, with, with parts of those platforms. In any way, I, I, I find that even if you choose for a platform, you, you, have, to, you have to interpret an organization. Uh, so let's say companies use GitHub internally or GitLab for something for, for um, managing their model code, you will have to integrate those repositories with some kind of build tool like Jenkins, GitLab runners, whatever it's available within the company in order to trigger uh, builds and deployments on, on the platform you're integrating. So some, I, I cannot imagine that there is no custom work at all involved, even if you, if, if you, uh, if, if you plan to use a platform to its full extent. Yeah. I, I think you're, you're very right there, Bechan. There, you can really take a, some platform as a basis, and then either in-house adapt it even further, or maybe if some of your ideas are broader applicable, you could even maybe give something back to the open source community and work together with with the uh, makers of the platform to yeah make the platform, for example, more secure or add more features to it that. Uh, that you require and that others might also benefit from. Excellent. So now when we talk about these different kind of platforms, there's a lot out there, right? Um, we've talked, we've touched on a few. Have you seen big differences between different platforms? Um, should I take this one by chance? Um, I think most of these platforms, they um, solve the main problem that we have been talking about the whole time, and that is bringing some model artifacts, some uh, serialized model into some running application. Uh, that's what they all do, and they all kind of do it well, because if I have a piece of Python code or I have a, a TensorFlow object or a scikit-learn object, I, I can pretty pretty easily get that into a running application. So that's that's all pretty the same for these uh, um, these systems. The way they do it that differs uh, quite a bit. So the the abstractions they use, the the way of integrating this code into a running application that that's what differs, and that's also 
yeah, one of the parts where yeah, you have to think thoroughly what what fits my company well. What what of the which of these extractions do I actually like? Also, I think most of these solutions. Back John, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of these solutions they focus on request response models. So they expose uh, a REST API or some uh, gRPC interface, and they do not focus on uh, batch or streaming APIs. Where yeah, some companies we work with they uh, try to work a lot of with, for example, streaming APIs, and uh, sometimes batch APIs might uh, might work uh, well as well for some use cases. So yeah, there the, the platforms are actually also uh, quite similar. Yeah, to add to that, if you look at the platforms which um, target corporate environments, then you will see that there's of course a lot of um, attention to security, governance, uh, like auditability of models, where do models come from, with which data were they trained, uh, which version is currently running into production, security, who has access to this model, which applications access to this model, do we use TLS certificates for, for accessing uh, for the over the line encryption and these kind of things. Um, uh, that's I think where the, the bigger ones such as Algorithmia and Selden uh, really stand out uh, with the uh, level, level of um, or with the depth of tooling they offer to 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 be successful in, in corporate environments where the, these kind of requirements are actually much more strict than in, in startup like companies. Yeah, and we've talked uh, about that before with um, Sarav when he was on here and how he was able to put together a an open source like basically a machine learning platform end to end. And what happened was is that it was great. He put it together, it worked really nicely, but then when you want to implement that into an enterprise, you really have to think about all this stuff that you just talked about. And you really have to be sure that you're not going to get into trouble later on down the line because you can't answer some of these questions that you were just mentioning. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that's a perfect way of putting it, how you're saying like, there's much more behind what is happening, not just the serving platform. You also need to know all this stuff too. And yeah, that's, that's to me what's, what makes this problem really interesting. I mean, um, uh, I mean, uh, the bank where I work, currently work, I mean, they, they basically have classifications for different kinds of data and the way data is classified basically determines uh, through which systems it can and can't go. And if you want to be one of those systems to which this data can go, then you actually have to, yeah, have to keep track of a lot of things. And um, mm. yeah, the more a platform can help you with that by providing all kinds of proofs that uh, data is encrypted and all these kind of things that you have access control and you can integrate with uh, with your organization's LDAP system or whatever they're using to, to do uh, authentication and these kind of things. And that makes integration easier, but not easy. <laughs> It's still, uh, I mean, those are complex environments with complex demands on the software running in them. And, um, yeah, that's also the fun of it, I guess, mm -hmm. for me at least. And so if we are going around and trying to shop around for a model serving platform, what would you recommend be some things that we need to keep in mind for our use cases and, and how to go about that? Do you want to take this one, Bajan? Um, well, shopping around, I, I mean, I would shop around. Uh, I would do that at the start when you start thinking about scaling up your machine learning capabilities for an organization. That's the point where I would do the shopping, but I would do the shopping in the forms of uh, POCs. Just let your team, which is building this platform, try a number of those platforms to get a feeling on if we want to deploy this platform, this particular platform in our infrastructure, how would that look like? If we take one or two of our current models and we want to run them in this platform, how does that look like? If we want to automate that, how would that look like? Just to give them a feeling about um, the, the, the can'ts and cannots when you choose a particular platform. And um, 
uh, yeah, as we have said before, there, there are many, many things within an organization which are influencing that. Uh, of course, the the infrastructure, but also, yeah, what's the what are the capabilities of the data scientists or the the engineering team which are bringing those platforms to production? What are the tools they're working with? How well do they do they integrate with the platform you're trying to bring in? And the way we address uh, the way I normally try to address this is by by taking like three or four use cases in an organization and just go with the teams through the process of bringing, the current process of bringing the model online. So which steps do you need to take in order to run your model in a compliant manner? And if you look at this process, you will of course see a number of similarities and then you can talk to the team like, hey, if we have to solve one problem to speed this process up, what would it be? And I would start with this problem. Like, okay, let, let, let's, we have now evaluated three or four platforms. Let's pick the one which seems most suitable and solve this particular problem and onboard those four use cases in order to prove to these teams that it actually brings them something. Because when you look at the platform, I think what's very important to make it successful in the long run, that you actually get it adopted by the teams who are supposed to use it. If you fail to do that, just bring in the platform and, and say, okay, from now on we're going to use it, then I would say you're bound to uh, bound to failure, basically. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you on that. And so, along those lines, what do you feel are some important factors if I want to decide to buy it? Would it be the same thing to look at? I know there's probably a lot of crossover, but is there anything else that you want to highlight that might stick out? I, I find this a very intriguing question because uh, I, I think a lot about this question. The, generally, if you look at building a platform, let's say you have a team of four or five people building a platform. I mean, the math is pretty simple. What it, what it costs only to run this team, and I'm just talking about paying those people to be in your office for 40 hours a week. It's quite huge already. So as an organization, you either must have a very clear view about what machine learning is bringing to your organization, and that can be financial, but it could also be um, uh, yeah, customer loyalty or whatever. I mean, I, I don't care what's important to you, but you must, I think, in my view, you must have a clear view as an organization what machine learning is bringing to your organization. If you don't, you're spending a lot, a lot of money. And then, so then if you start talking about buying, you're just adding to that. So then you, you as an organization, say you're at a point where you either made a strategic choice, like, hey, uh, we want to become a data, uh, data-driven company, and we see a strategic value of machine learning in that strategy. Uh, so then costs become less important and then then I think uh, the machine learning platform itself is not the highest cost anyway. Yeah, I remember I, as you're talking about that, I remember a story of a guy I was talking to um, almost a year ago and he was a consultant in a company and the company was trying to change into this data-driven path platform company right or like a data-driven company i should say and right now all of the higher ups were just looking at the data science team as a money suck all they were doing is just walking around they weren't putting anything into production they weren't doing much looking at data asking for more data and they weren't actually producing anything and so the you know the c-level executives were like hey what are we paying these guys for what is what is going on here and they couldn't figure out the value and so do you have any any experiences like that have you seen that and how can you get out of it if it is the current experience maybe for some of us yeah i think this is uh yeah a situation that we actually see a lot where uh a company wants to do data science so they hire a bunch of uh, data scientists uh they pull open another can of uh, data scientists and uh give them a lot of data and expect that uh, a few months later, uh, something magical happened and they, they earned a lot of money. And while uh, the data scientist is really good at uh, dissecting a business problem into 
uh, a data problem and by building a, a model with data to solve this problem, the data scientist is generally not very experienced at software engineering at, at um, yeah, making this uh, model turn into an actual value generating application. So yeah, we see this problem a lot and the solution is here. Yeah, the, the engineering part is missing. So if you get started doing data science, focus on uh, a proof of concept, focus on one use case. If it's in the early stage seems to generate value, make sure that you build an end-to-end -end product out of it and prove to your uh, to your C level that it, it actually generates value. And from there on, the, the trust is there. You can expand your teams with more engineers, with more uh, data scientists, and you can together build a, a ecosystem of running applications rather than an ecosystem of uh, Jupyter notebooks that are never looked at again. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. To add, to add to that, I mean, the engineering aspect is is one part which data scientists are not trained for. But uh, the other part, which are which for which data scientists and data engineers are not trained for, is is process management and change management. Because often when you bring in a machine learning model, it also requires some change in some kind of process, and sometimes even change in behavior of people working in the organization, not related to the technical aspects of data science at all. And um, that, that, that's exactly why, why I was talking about this complexity problem before, because I mean, creating a model, given that you have data is a challenging part, but not rocket science. Bringing this model to production is challenging, but again, not rocket science. But then adapting your organization and your process in such a way that the model actually starts changing the way you behave as an organization or changing the behavior of a particular process in your organization. That's the really challenging part. And, um, well, I mean, in my career, I actually start to realize that, that, that I should pay more attention to this because you can, I mean, the technical problems are really fun to work on, mm -hmm. but in the end, uh, you're not paid to do fun things, but to actually add value to an organization. And, and this is a really important aspect of that. Yeah, it, it reminds me of a talk that we had with uh, Charles Martin, and he was very adamant about how MLOps is an organizational problem. It's not necessarily a technical problem. And his whole thing is, you know, maybe data scientists aren't getting to train their data with real data. They're using replica data. And then you go to the real data and it's not really, it's not exactly there. And so he, uh, if anyone wants to watch that, I'll put a link to it in the, um, in the show notes or in the chat. And it's a great listen. He's very adamant. Um, but so, I got another question here about different languages. And I know that Python is kind of eating the world right now. Uh, but I'm wondering if you've seen a lot of Python being compiled into these lower languages or Python being compiled maybe into Java or C++ when you need to put it out into production, when you want to take your model and put it out into production. Have you seen a lot of that? Do you want to take this one, Bachan, or should I uh, go ahead? Yeah, I can can talk a bit about how we approach this in uh, my current customer. Um, we said from the start that we wanted to be language agnostic. Um, we had seen an initiative before where they used uh, PNML as the interface uh, between the model developers and the, and the hosting platform. and. Uh, yeah, to some extent that works. I think they run quite some models within this organization uh, this way. Uh, but sooner or later, you hit the limitations of PML. Um, and the way we worked around that was not by compiling languages into other languages or into lower machine code, but by uh, setting an interface which we expect on the on the function level. So basically our level of abstraction from the data science team is a function. We, we say, okay, given that you have Python, your model has to implement this function with this interface. It, it gets certain input in this format and produces an output in this format. And if you, as long as you adhere to that, we will wrap the application around it, which provides a GRPC or an HTTP interface or whatever is required. 
which then is exposed to the environment. So then you have basically decoupled um, the, how a model is exposed uh, from the technicalities of the language which is used. Because of course you could implement something similar for R, you could, something, you could implement something similar for Java, for C++, whatever. Um, although developments currently seem to focus on Python mostly, um, I saw in Google Trends recently that R is spiking up again, so who knows uh, that we see that coming up uh, soon. And my language, uh, Julia, is also uh, catching up. So uh, I think being language agnostic as a platform will become more important in the future. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean that you have to compile languages uh, from one to the other. Unless you get to very specific performance requirements, I guess. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those? Well, I mean, if you really make, need to make a prediction within, uh, within a couple of milliseconds, uh, you cannot make it happen uh, with, with Python uh, because of the inter interpreter overhead or something like that. Uh, then, then, you, then you need to figure out what to do. But that, that, that's, I would say that that's definitely not the majority of cases currently. So you will have to bring in a specialist anyway then. Yeah. yeah. And I th also think by forcing your prediction code into a certain language also, yeah, creates a barrier between people that do experiments and people that create production applications because often uh, a Scala or a Java programmer is a whole different type of person or has a whole different skill set than uh, a Python developer or maybe a data scientist who, well, it's also partly a, a Python developer. So by saying, okay, you have to compile your models into some other language or your systems in some other language, you're basically saying, okay, the data scientist can only do the first part and the, the Java developer has to do the second part. And yeah, this... Yeah, this fence that you create where people throw things over, well, it's a very dangerous structure that, yeah, kind of makes it hard to, yeah, bring a model end-to-end -end into, into production. So you have to be, yeah, re really careful with, uh, with these uh, decisions. Great points. So we're nearing the end of the hour. I've got one more question I want to ask, but I also want to open it up to everyone that is here with us. If anyone out there has any questions for these lovely gents that are with us, feel free to throw it into the chat and I will ask it or just unmute yourself if you'd like. The last question that I have, I wanted to talk about when you are adding new models and rolling them out. I know that is something that when I was at Dot Science, people asked us all the time, like, oh, do you have A B testing or canary? um rollouts right uh, like how do i get this out and make sure that this model is better than what i was i'm currently using so can you talk to that a bit yeah so finding out whether a model is better than a previous model it's i think it's a it's a quite interesting problem and also quite hard to uh, to give uh, a formal answer to you can, you can do it in an early stage with uh, some kind of uh, gatekeeping mechanism that before you deploy a new model, it can uh, be run against uh, some form of test set and check whether at least on this test set, the, uh, the model performs good or better than uh, the model that's currently running in, uh, in production. That can, uh, this gatekeeper can actually be part of your, like your CICD pipeline or your your first step into your platform when actually running the model, A B testing there, well, it's, it's quite an advanced topic, I would say. Most companies we work with, they're, they're happy if they bring models into production and they're able to, to update them every now and then. And these topics we don't see a lot. I think on the other hand, um, a lot of these topics are already solved quite well for uh, general software applications with um, platforms like uh, Kubernetes, which all already builds in these can canary deployments uh, out of the box and which also allows you to easily run a model side to side. We can actually translate a lot of this knowledge into 
um, our model serving platforms and uh, and use it there in a similar way. Yeah, what I'd like to add there is that, um, uh, as Axel said, it's, it's an advanced topic because basically what you, if you think about it, let's say you have a model deployed and now you're starting to work on a new version of the same model, um, meaning you're spending time, effort and resources on developing a new version of something which is already running. How much gain would you get from that as, as opposed to uh, solving a different problem in the same process you're working on? Let's say you get a 1% gain by having a new model. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most processes lend themselves for a 5% gain if you solve a different part of the, of the same process. Meaning if you get to the point where you start deploying multiple models for the same problem, you have basically optimized your whole organization already. And I, it would definitely be, I mean, at least at the place where I work, I would definitely not say this is the first thing you need to start working on. Yeah, I think also an A-B test, while in, in theory it sounds really appealing, in practice it, it can actually be quite hard because let's, let's take a, a banking example again, for a transaction fraud detection. So let's say you have a model that can detect these uh, transactional frauds. Uh, how are you going to see how good your model is? You would have to, for every transaction that you score, you would have to wait till someone actually tells you that it was an, uh, a fraudulent transaction and that uh, can actually take weeks or maybe months before someone recognizes that someone has been messing with their cards. So doing such an A-B test will also take weeks uh, up to months there. So for many of these machine learning problems, it's really hard to run models in parallel and tell you which, which of these models works better in a predictive way yeah the feedback loop isn't there it's not so quick that yeah like it is maybe in software development and yeah you have some you have a lot of applications uh, and use cases where this is the case let's let's take the, the netflix use case where you recommend movies well if more people <coughs> click on that movie or more people like this movie you know the you know that probably your your new model is better and you can see that within a few days because netflix as short movies, we got they are only like two hours, and a lot of people are watching them. But mm. yeah, it's the, the use cases to for A/B testing are, are very specific, I think, and so that makes wanna... the feature yeah not not the first feature I would worry about when uh, looking into such platforms. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point too. It's much more of a mature problem potentially once you're getting further on down the road. So I want to give a shout out to Jet and he's got his hand raised. Jet, I think you're unmuted. Do you want to go ahead and ask the last question for us? Yeah, sure, sure. Hey guys, thank you for that talk and you, you really um, understand the organization and culture aspects of this, this MLOps thing. Um, but actually I'm just looking at serving myself and this question of using things like Seldon commodities, commodity um, solutions. Um, Axel, you talked about how you might back yourself into paint yourself into a corner. Um, but Bertrand, you talked about the fact that you're evaluating it now. All right, so you guys are technically mature and culturally mature as well. Um, but you also seem to be moving in that direction as well. There's, is there some value in that commoditization like standards? Like in web, we have standards around, we don't build web servers all the time. Um, and have you really come across cases where you were locked into some corner that you couldn't deal with? Um, I think um, there currently there is not really a lot of standardization yet because there are different products out there and they all do do this stuff. That's part of what Selden is trying to do. They're participating in that um, standardization, aren't they? And, and they're participating in other people. They're forming those standards now. Yeah, so I'm. I, I would be a bit. I, I don't know about it actually, but I, I would be a big proponent of standardizing at least some of these concepts, and by isolating some of these features and creating standards for them. For example, putting the model into production, you could create a standard for this. Um, the monitoring part, you could create a standard for this, uh, etc. So I, 
yes, I, I will be a, a big proponent of that because yeah, then we can uh, reuse it. Yeah. And have you, really, you know, how often do you paint yourself into a corner? Um, you know, I think you guys are right. The, the problems aren't in these little corner cases or in A-B testing or any of those things that sound exciting. It's just the basics of, of the culture, getting people to use these ways in ways that are optimal um, for, the, for the thing. And, you know, worrying about serving infrastructure, if we can simplify that, is that not better rather than worrying that might be some edge case we can't support? Yeah, so... So our team is indeed evaluating uh, Selden and, and Hydro for at this moment, but uh, only for very specific parts. Um, so currently we have a custom model wrapping uh, tool which we wrote ourselves, and, and that's that's ex that's exactly the part we are evaluating Selden and uh, Hydro Sphere on for this moment. Mm -hmm. And um, generally, I mean, as an engineer, and uh, but then <laughs> I, I would. I would go for open source tooling as much as possible, yeah. and not go for buy-in uh, for for uh, for off-the-shelf components which are closed source, because then sooner or later you will probably hit some kind of limitation in your organization. But on the other hand, this could be a conscious choice. Take a look, for example, at Selden and Algorithmia. Those are uh, getting to into decent companies with with good engineering teams behind behind those toolings. And then you can basically just choose as a user, like, hey, uh, in the same way you choose uh, Azure over AWS, you know, both more or less offer the same capabilities, both have their own limitations, sooner or later you will run into them, but you make a conscious choice not to, um, not to hinder yourself by those, because you know that the overall gain I get from choosing Azure or for choosing Selden it's much higher than the limitations you will eventually hit into. And especially when companies behind these tools become more mature, it becomes more appealing to start integrating in, in, in your organization. Very well put. And thank you for that question, Jet. I can. see that Joe had his hand up too, and I wanna be conscious of y'all's time. So do you have enough time to field another question from Joe? Yeah, for me it's uh, completely fine, yeah. Cool. I, I love it when you all get into it. Uh, and so, Joe, if you're unmuted, feel free to jump in and ask away. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I guess let me start off with a, a statement first. Um, in, in my experience, life is so much simpler if you avoid complexity. Um, and I would suggest the best uh, serving platform is not to buy one because then you are creating complexity. If all your data is on Hadoop, and that's where it exists. If you don't have capabilities in Kubernetes, if, if you don't really, if your models don't need it, then don't buy a platform. Just be, a, be opinionated if you can. I think that the, I've run into a lot of problems because, you know, sometimes the organization says, we want this, we want this, we want this. And before you know it, you have to support a hundred different features. It's a lot simpler if you can be far more opinionated. If you look at, for example, Uber or Twitter or a lot of the, you know, well-known platforms, they are highly opinionated. They will, you know, there's one way of training a model. And then you have to fit within that paradigm. And, and that allows them to provide a lot of advanced features like feature store and online training, online serving which are extremely difficult if you start in, in, in implementing the complexity. I, I guess that, that's kind of my statement. So what do you, the question is, what, what do you guys suggest if someone is just starting out? Should they build out a platform or should they, you know, should, is it build or buy? And at what point do, do they have to buy a platform? At what, what point do they actually reach that complexity where they have to buy a platform? Yeah, yeah, I don't. Oh, do you want to talk about this, Bertrand? Or oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can so much relate to your statement, uh, Joseph. Uh, just to give you a funny detail, our the platform we currently built uh, at our customer is actually deploying Docker containers on VMs managed by the team, and that's just because managing VMs within this organization it's much easier than managing a Kubernetes cluster. So I totally adhere there, and, and I, I totally agree that you should avoid complexity as much as possible. Um, but but that, that does not necessarily bring you to the buy or build discussion directly, I think, because uh, as I said, we are also evaluating, uh, integrating some of these tools, at least some of the capabilities of these tools, uh, in order to, yeah, 
get rid of some of the complexity we have brought in anyway. Because if you start building your tools, you will start, I mean, you start with some simple scripts and sometimes at some point you build your own tool, you, you develop your own level of complexity as well. And then at some point you might find that the trade-off is that it's better to replace part of your current pipeline with existing tooling because they just solve the problem slightly better and you can offload basically a part of the maintenance of your whole stack or platform or whatever you want to call it to to this kind of toolings for example the model wrapping part yeah and i as but john said i don't think that buying versus building is the same as uh complex as this complexity versus uh, simplicity statement you talked about if uh product you buy actually fits really well into how your organization already works well then it's actually quite simple to uh, to get that product it, instead of building basically the same product yourself with uh, some minor uh, minor tweaks on them so the the point is you have to analyze what your company needs for uh, yeah and such that you can actually make a, a good decision here Beautifully put, fellas. I want to say thank you. And really, it's been an awesome discussion about serving platforms and the whole just universe that comes with it, right? It's not just about a serving platform because there's so much more that we need to look at when we are talking about serving. And I want to thank everyone that is still here with us. It's been an awesome chat with you two. It's been really nice. If anyone is not in our Slack, I'm just going to say it again, jump in it. I want to also mention that we are doing model, well, we're calling them engineering labs. And in the MLOps community, we're going to be doing what we're, we've labeled as engineering labs. If you want to know more about it, it's basically like a voyage and we are getting people to practice these different use cases and try and use real world uh, problems that we need to solve, but you know, away from work so you don't have to mess anything up. And you get experience through doing, but you don't have all the pressure on you that you're going to destroy something at work and cost the company thousands or millions of dollars. So big thank you to you both. It's been awesome. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Enjoy your summer day. I will see you all next week for more of our MLOps community. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you for having us, Dimitris. It was a pleasure.